Hey, are you a seller of a property? You're thinking about selling your property on subject to or seller finance. This might be a good video for you. My name is Pace Morby and if you don't know me, I am the author of a Wall Street Journal best-selling book published with Bigger Pockets, one of the biggest companies in the real estate space, all about creative finance. I have been talked about as the most creative investor in the nation. Now, Am I trying to brag and bloat? No, I'm not. I just wanna make sure you know that what you're about to learn is from somebody who's done thousands of these transactions. And actually, I teach attorneys, I teach real estate agents and brokers how to do these strategies. And so today in this video, I wanna tell you, the seller, what you should probably be asking before you do a creative finance deal. This might be a long video, and I apologize in advance. I'm just one of those people that I prefer to have people talk to me rather than have things hyper edited and all planned out. I want to feel like I'm having a conversation with you. So get your pen and paper out. If you are about to do a deal with maybe one of my students or maybe even me, this will be really, really helpful for you. So I wrote down a lot of things that I want you to make sure as the seller of a creative finance deal you are asking. And the first question I would ask is why? Why are you selling your property on creative finance? Now, creative finance is letting somebody make payments to either you or take over your existing payments on your loan. Today, we bought two properties just right before this. If you wanna see a video of that deal and the addresses, we'll give a link in the description down below. Creative Finance allows me, the buyer, to pay more money to the seller. And so that's the number one reason why a seller would sell on seller finance is because they get more money, they receive more money. So the number one reason you're gonna to wanna to sell on Creative Finance is more money. Okay, now that money is in the form typically of payments. It's also in the form of tax savings. So you can get tax savings by selling on seller finance. I'll give you a good example. We just bought a big RV park in Montana. Glacier National Park is maybe five miles away from us. Amazing property. The seller, Eric, lived in Bozeman. The property's up in Glacier, which is about three and a half, four hour drive for him. And it was just problematic. He didn't want that asset anymore. And he said, I want top dollar. And he hires a real estate agent, hires a real estate broker, puts it on the market for many months. The market would not pay the price that Eric, the seller, wanted to get. And so along comes my team. Jordan on my team calls the seller, calls the broker and says, looks, it looks like the property's been on the market for a long time. The property obviously is not as valuable as you thought it was for cash buyers. So why don't you sell it to us and we'll give you the price you want as long as you give us the terms that we need. So in this $5 million purchase, we gave the seller exactly the number he needed. He wanted 5 million. He was just married to that number and it makes sense. He put time, energy, risk into that property, but turns out it just wasn't for him. He wanted to buy in Bozeman, Montana, not Glacier but he didn't want to, to be a victim of what's going on in the marketplace right now where interest rates are really high. So if Eric, the seller, he's got this property, let's just put a P there, and the buyer that has to pay the property, the, the value that Eric is asking for, the buyer has to go to a bank and go get an eight to maybe 9% interest rate loan. And because that interest rate is so heavy right now, it makes the buyer's ability to pay Eric's asking price almost impossible. So what we did is we went back to Eric and we said, hey, if we're the buyer, how about we just remove the need for banks and you, the seller, become our bank and we'll give you the $5 million that you're asking for. We'll give you a little down payment, but we'll give you a high purchase price. And so I look at it like a teeter-totter. Okay, here's the teeter-totter. High purchase price typically, Seller wants a high purchase price, you better be giving your buyer a low down payment and a low interest rate to make it worth their time. I see a lot of sellers that say, well, yeah, I want my $5 million sales price on this big asset, and I also want 10% interest. Well, what's in it for the buyer? And we'll talk about how to make sure that the buyer is taken care of because the number one way to make sure you are safe as a seller in a real estate transaction involving creative finance is making sure your buyer can actually make money on that purchase. What happens if I don't make money on this purchase and I pay a really high purchase price, a really high interest rate, and I can't operate the asset? I lose money and then I just give up and I give the property back to Eric. That's not what you want. So I get a lot of sellers that will ask the what ifs. 
What if the buyer can't make the payments? Why would you, the seller, sell a property to a buyer that you don't know the buyer can make money on? That's irresponsible. I would not do that as a seller. I would make sure my buyer can make money. I wanna make sure they have a lower down payment, a good interest rate, and a good length of time. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But I went to Eric, said, I'll give you the high purchase price as long as we get a good interest rate. So what he, get, he, what he got was a high purchase price. The property's probably worth 4.4, 4.6, we give him 5 million. I paid hundreds of thousands of dollars more. And because I'm the buyer, there was no commissions that needed to come out of his pocket for me. So he got a higher purchase price, remember, more money. And then he also got tax savings because I'm not giving all of that money to him up front. You only get taxed on money you receive. And because Eric is receiving this money over several years, he'll be able to mitigate and lower his capital gains tax by making sure that that money is spread out over a period of time. Now, he got his high purchase price, so we asked him for a 5% down payment and 4% interest on our side with a 10-year term. And he says, done. We just closed escrow on this a couple of weeks ago. Gorgeous property up in Glacier. And we're actually buying a second property from him three miles away because the transaction went so well. Eric wins because he got a high purchase price and he's gonna get big tax savings and no commission. So this is another one. On my side with a buyer, commissions are lowered, right? Now, if you have a real estate investor or real estate agent involved, we'll touch base on that in a little bit. This is gonna be a longer video. So again, get your pen and paper. I didn't have to charge my seller any commissions on my side because there were no buyer's agent representing me. We were working directly with the seller and the agent. And we worked that stuff out. Now, sadly, the agent was here representing the seller. And why do I say sadly? You will find in creative finance that the biggest challenge in creative finance is uneducated real estate agents and uneducated attorneys. Believe it or not, they don't learn these things in school. They have to learn these things on the job, just like all of us. And when you hire a real estate agent who doesn't have any experience in creative finance, they did not teach it in school. They teach it in continued education. It is a requirement for real estate agents and brokers to get educated on these topics, but most of the time, they're just skimming through their continued education. It is what it is. I'm very sorry, but it's true. And the agent was actually our biggest problem on this transaction. The agent didn't know what contract for deed was. And I imagine maybe if you're a seller, you don't know what a contract for deed is. Didn't know what seller finance truly meant. Didn't know what terms we needed to work out. And so most of the time as the buyer, I was just trying to educate the real estate agent. And what ended up happening is most of the negotiation was actually going on behind the broker's back because the seller was frustrated with the fact that their agent didn't know what they were talking about. So you're gonna run into that a lot. So whenever I criticize agents, I'll tell you about 99%, and I'm not exaggerating that, 99% of real estate agents do not understand creative finance. They don't understand seller finance. They might know what the term means, but if you tell them to structure a good deal for the seller and the buyer, they couldn't do it. So most of the time, agents are gonna be a problem and also closing attorneys are gonna be a problem. So make sure you ask the questions that I'm gonna tell you to ask. But the first thing you wanna ask is, why? Why am I selling on creative finance? Well, again, one, more money. Two, tax savings. Three, you save a, money, a lot of money on commission. Number four, time. If Eric, the seller, sold his property for $5 million to a conventional buyer, that would have taken four to six months. Why? Well, because they're going to have to go out and get financing and raise money and bring investors in and do this whole thing called a Reg D offering, which we don't need to talk about today, but they're going to go and raise a bunch of capital from other investors, and it takes months and months and months to do. The buyer also would have gone through a lot more due diligence, okay? Now, number five, there is something beautiful about this is that there are less people involved in a creative finance transaction, okay? So for example, if I'm not going and getting a bank loan, right, as the buyer, the seller is letting me make payments. He's saying, hey, I'll sell it to you for 5 million. We're gonna create an agreement between us where you give me 5% down, so that's 250 grand. 4% interest, and I'll let you make payments to me for 10 years. That's our terms. The bank is actually Eric. Eric is the bank. So there's no need for me to go to a bank 
Therefore, there's less people involved. What does that mean? Another big reason why this is a benefit to you as the seller is if there's less people involved, there's less costs associated and there's also less problems. Now, if you've sold property before with traditional means, there's about 51 people involved in a real estate transaction. Believe it or not, we don't need to go into that, but there's a lot of people in a traditional real estate transaction that slow the process down. Appraisers, for example. What do I need an appraiser for? If I'm buying the property directly from, from Eric and Eric is the one giving me the loan, right? That's you, the seller. You are acting as the bank with the buyer. What do I need an appraiser for? I don't. I also don't need a survey. And if I choose to do so, I also don't need a full-blown inspection, which actually I did not do on this property. I bought a $5 million piece of real estate without an appraiser, without an inspection, did not hire an inspector. We didn't have a survey. We didn't do any of those things. We made the process very, very simple and easy for the seller. My equation, usually what we find is there's about seven less people involved in a creative finance transaction. So if you decide, maybe you're a seller that's in foreclosure. I don't know. We just bought a property today. One of the properties we closed on, the seller was in foreclosure and the seller was about to lose their house within about, I think it was two days. So if you're going to lose your house in two days, are you going to be able to go through a buyer that's going to go get a loan and have all these people involved in real estate age? No, the best thing for you is let the buyer come in. I, as a buyer buying with subject to or seller finance, I can close typically within 12 to 36 hours in a very quick manner. Now, I prefer four to 10 days, but even that, what if you have four to 10 days to close a real estate transaction? I don't know any agents or brokers or loan officers that are closing transactions start to finish in less than 10 days. Just doesn't happen. So less people, less problems, less cost, less time, more money in your pocket. Tax savings are significant for sellers, significant. And most of the time when I, when I realized creative finance was a thing, I actually started asking the question of why would a seller ever sell their house with cash? It doesn't make sense. They're gonna get hit with a capital gain, right? If it's not your primary home, you're gonna hit, get hit with a capital gain. That's huge. And when you get that big chunk of money right up front, that's a problem. So big tax savings. In fact, I get most of my sellers. Eric, this seller here on the Glacier Park, hired a CPA to go through and verify everything that I was saying about how much taxes he's saving. And the CPA came back and said, I learned something I did not know today. He had to go back and verify it with the IRS, verified the fact that this seller can stretch out his taxes over 10 years instead of getting it all hit up front. So there's a lot of reasons why sellers will sell on seller finance. Now, these are good, positive motivators. There are other reasons why sellers sell to us on seller finance, and here are some of them. Some of them, if you are selling subject to or sub to, that's the logo we have here, and you'll see the logo all over the place, subject to, doesn't actually mean the number two, but it's just been our logo. One of the biggest reasons why somebody will sell to us on subject to is because they have a lack of equity. Now, what does equity actually mean? This is a problem real estate agents don't understand, and most people actually in real estate don't understand what equity truly is. They think that if I have a house, let's say I go to Zillow right now, and Zillow tells me my house is worth $400,000, and I owe my bank $370,000, let's say uh, it's Chase Bank, right? Let's say I have a loan with Chase at 370, and Zillow tells me my house is worth 40. Well, that's a problem because there usually are people that will say, yep, there's $30,000 in equity here. Pace, there's a $30,000 chunk of equity. No, there's not. In fact, this seller has negative equity. They're upside down. They have less than $10,000. They have negative $10,000 in equity. Why? Look it up. The average cost to sell a house in America is 10%. I'm going to say that again. The average cost to sell a house on the real estate market with an agent and another agent, closing costs, um, concessions, all the little minor repairs that you've got to do on the house, the average cost to sell a house is 10%. So 10% of four, 400000 is $40,000. So it's going to cost me 
agent's commission. You know how many people are involved in a real estate transaction that the seller has to pay for? You've got your agent. You've got the other agent that's representing the buyer. Then you've got the title company, right? You've got the appraisers. You've got all these other people are getting paid in order for you to sell your house. And the seller typically pays for the majority of those things. So if your cost to sell this is $40,000, do you really have 30,000 in equity? No, you have negative $10,000 in equity, negative $10,000 in equity. So a lot of the sellers that we buy houses from, they do the math and their agent, this is kind of sad, but this kind of highlights to you one of the things I'm gonna ask you to ask, does your real estate agent know what they're doing? with creative finance? And the answer is they don't really know what they're doing a lot of times in traditional real estate, believe it or not. I get sellers that list their property for 400, they only owe 370, and their agent never explained the fact that the seller is gonna come out of pocket the day they close escrow with their new buyer. I would be asking your agent for a seller net sheet. Okay, this is something that agents are taught in school, but they do not use it. Seller net sheet tells you, the seller, exactly how much money it's going to cost to sell the house, how much money you'll have after you do sell the house and everybody's been paid, how much you'll walk away with. What typically happens is the seller will find out they're writing a check for 10 grand to get rid of their house. So this is a very, very, very common scenario in subject two lack of equity, right? So this is kind of a painful situation. It's not great. Millions of homes are underwater. And you look at this and you say, no, they're not. The reality is after you understand the math, they are, okay? In fact, one of the properties we bought today, that's exactly what was going on. And so that's a big one, lack of equity. And once you understand that, here's the great thing. If you have $10,000 that's gonna come out of your pocket to sell with a real estate agent, but an investor like me will take over your payments because I like your interest rate and I like your house and I also have the patience to own the property for multiple years to get a return out of it because I'm a professional real estate investor and I have teams and I have strategies that will help me make money on this property, but not usually in the first or second year. I have to be patient year three, year four, year five it benefits me, I'm not really buying your house in subject to, I'm buying your interest rate. Now, I get some sellers right now, especially sellers that got new interest or new loans in 2023 and they're going through a divorce or something bad is going on or they are going through a deployment in the army, so they bought a house. This, this happens a lot too. You'll get a, let's say a vet will go buy a house with a VA loan and the VA loan doesn't require them to put any money down so then let's say six months later, the army says, we're going to deploy you somewhere else. And the seller says, oh, dang it. I got to sell my house because I'm not a real estate investor and I don't want to be a real estate investor. The vet will then decide to hire a real estate agent. The agent will do exactly what I just told you, which is they'll put the house on the market without telling the vet that the vet's going to have to come out of pocket 20 or 30,000, maybe even $40,000 to sell the house. So if you're a vet and you're not getting paid tremendous amount of money, are you really gonna enjoy hearing that agent tell you at the end of escrow that you have to write a check for 30, 40,000? No. So this vet's not in foreclosure. He's not going through a divorce. He has a true situation going on where he doesn't want that property anymore, but he can't sell it. The challenge is sometimes these vets now have 6% rates. I don't want a 6% rate. I want three. In fact, the properties we bought today, again, link in the description down below, We'll give you a video of us closing on two properties today. The blended rate between the two properties is 1.5%. That's not a great rate for me. How am I going to be able to make money on that property? And so if you do find a buyer to take that, there probably is a buyer to buy that property, but we call these buyers homestead buyers, right? That's somebody that's gonna live in the house. They don't care about the ability to cash flow on the property. They say 6%, that's better than the 8% rate. That's awesome. Well, that's not an investor. Investor is not gonna want this property, but a homestead buyer might. So some of my students, for example, might be working with your agent or working with you. And if you have a 6% rate, they might not be the ones that are buying that property. They might be taking that property and helping, find, helping you find a buyer that will actually live in the property, okay? 
So subject two has equity or, or a lack of equity, or there's a change happening in their life. There's a divorce, there's a bankruptcy, there's something going on in their life that motivates them to sell via subject two, okay? Seller finance, typically very different. I tell people all the time, subject two is typically there's a painful situation happening and seller finance, like I said earlier about Eric, the seller on the RV park, they're looking for a large gain. Most of the sellers on seller finance, the ones that own the property free and clear or have a lot of equity, they're just looking for a higher number than the market will give them. And with creative finance, you can get that number as long as, again, the teeter-totter is in balance. So there you go. There's the reasons why a seller would sell on seller finance. Now let's go into some questions you should be asking and making sure you understand, okay? Number one, is subject two and seller finance legal where I live? Now, you're gonna have to know the answer to this in all 50 states is the same. The answer is yes. In all 50 states, even Puerto Rico, all the territories in the US and a lot of countries around the, around the world, subject to, or as we just commonly refer to as sub two, and seller finance are all 100% legal. You will run into a lot of people. In fact, I'll give you a video, another link in the description down below, of me interviewing one of my attorneys, Harry Marsh out of North and South Carolina. He's a closing attorney there. And he'll express in that video how he commonly runs into agents and other attorneys who have never done these transactions. And you will also run into them yourself. Here's the sad thing. If you run into an agent or a broker that says that these things are illegal, run from these people immediately. Do not work with these people or ask these people to actually get somebody who's experienced in these things to do the deal with them. What I will typically do if I'm buying a deal and there's a broker involved that's saying this is illegal, I will bring my attorney, Sean, and I will have my attorney walk him through and educate him on something he obviously does not understand. But if you are working with an agent, a broker, or an attorney that says these things are illegal, I'm telling you right now, they are so wrong, they are inexperienced, and they have not actually read the law. What I'll do is I'll give you a link, again, with my interview with, with Harry Marsh, and I'll give you a link to Sean St. Clair's website. So if you want to hire Sean St. Clair and get a third-party opinion, Sean St. Clair will absolutely walk your attorney, your broker, your agent through those things. But typically, you just need to talk to a broker or an attorney that knows what they're doing. Welcome to real estate. Real estate's no different. Title companies, escrow officers, real estate agents are probably the worst, and then closing attorneys are right behind them. If they're not experienced in the thing, do you think they're going to admit to you, the person that is paying them, do you think they're going to admit that they don't know what they're talking about? The answer is no, they're not. And I don't need to, I, I'm not trying to beat them up. I'm trying to make sure you are aware of this because this is something that I deal with commonly. In fact, tonight, you'll see on my calendar, this, this is one of the things that I work on all the time. Tonight, right here, Agent Zoom at 6 p.m. right here. I have a Zoom tonight with a real estate agent where one of my students in my sub two community is asking me to educate an agent. The agent originally thought that subject two was illegal. Then we sent them documents where the IRS shows you how to do subject two and seller finance. The HUD main website shows you how to do sub two and seller finance. There's actually a line item on settlement statements that allows you to just cross in subject two. And then also we show agents where their continued education in all 50 states has subject two and seller finance and novations and wraps and all these other creative finance strategies are all taught in continued education with agents, brokers, and closing attorneys. The problem is they will not admit to you or even themselves that they are not educated on these things, so what will they default and say? They will say, subject to and seller finance is illegal. So if you are a seller and you are talking to one of my students, send me an email. We'll put it in the link down below. I'll give you my personal email and I will send you legal line items showing you exactly where it is legal in the United, all 50 states and all territories 
that you can sell your property subject to and seller finance, okay? So another question you've got to ask yourself is, who is my buyer? This is a big deal. Who is your buyer? I wish I could give you a full real estate education, Mr. or Mrs. Seller. I wish I could give you a full real estate education, but typically here's you, you've got this property, you're either living in it or maybe you have a tenant. Doesn't really matter for this scenario. A lot of times you've consulted a real estate agent where most of the time real estate agents, they don't even own their own real estate. Most real estate agents don't own their primary home and even more of those real estate agents do not own a single rental property. So you are hiring an individual who went through a two week class to sell your piece of real estate that the only way they would know how to be a really great real estate investor is if they went five, 10 years being out in the real estate world and did these deals themselves. It's very rare, it doesn't happen that often. It's 1% of agents, I call them unicorn agents. But what's gonna happen is you're gonna have a buyer, at least somebody who's posing as a buyer. A lot of times you'll have a buyer that will say, hi, real estate agent, I'm a real estate investor, I wanna buy the property, we wanna do subject to or seller finance. The agent says, okay, great, sounds awesome. This is becoming more and more common. One of the goals we had with this YouTube channel was to normalize the conversation around creative finance, and I think we've done a good job with that. Again, Wall Street Journal number one bestseller last summer, all about these strategies and these tactics, okay? So we're doing a good job. We're normalizing these conversations. So a lot of real estate agents are now coming to the, the positive side of this. The agent says, okay, I'll work it out with my, my seller. Cool, they work out terms. They say, here's the purchase price. Here's the thing, here's, here's all of our terms. And I'll get to terms in a little bit. The buyer then has control over this contract, right? The buyer now has this contract and one of multiple things are gonna happen, okay? One, that buyer is going to actually invest and buy the property themselves. Two, they're gonna do what is called wholesaling. And they're going to take that contract and they'll find somebody like me who is investing themselves and they'll ask me to pay them a finder's fee. Guess what? This is also legal, perfectly legal. It's legal in all states, anybody can do this. They can wholesale the contract to me and I can pay them a $5,000 fee, a $10,000 fee, a $50,000 fee. In fact, we paid somebody, one of my students last year got $150,000 finder's fee for bringing a big multifamily property to me on seller finance. So these buyers sometimes are not necessarily buyers. You should probably know that. Now, should you be bothered that somebody's making money on finding a buyer for you and wholesaling a transaction? Absolutely not. You don't get upset when Amazon makes money because they found a product and sold it to you. In fact, it's talking about the book. Amazon sells this book. Am I upset that Amazon is making money bridging the two gaps and finding the actual buyer? Amazon's not the buyer of this. They buy it from me, Amazon then sells it to the consumer, and Amazon makes a finder's fee. They're essentially wholesaling my book. So this also happens in real estate. You need to be aware of this. I would ask the buyer, are you planning on wholesaling this? And if they say yes, don't be upset. You need to ask them, perfect, no problem. I imagine you're gonna get a finder's fee for this, but I wanna know who my buyer is. And I'll get to that in a second. The third thing that could be happening is they could be um, moving in themselves, okay? because some of the sellers that are coming around in the marketplace now have 6%, 5%, 7% rates, which I don't love. I don't want to invest in those rates. So typically I will help find a family. We call them the homestead buyer. We just talked about it a little bit ago. And the homestead buyer will pay that person also a fee, okay? So these are the three things that are happening when somebody's working at a deal with your, real estate, with your real estate agent or maybe even with you directly. I would ask your buyer, are you intending to invest this yourself? Great. Here's the next question. What are you planning to do with it? Now, why is this an important question? For a while, when I was first starting in the business, I didn't want the sellers to know what I was doing, the property. I didn't feel like it was their business. It literally is not their business, it's my business. 
But if I'm asking the seller to be the bank and I'm asking the seller to like, let me take over payments, don't you think it would benefit me to make sure the seller and I have a very good agreement and a very good long-term relationship? The answer is yes. You're going to have a long-term relationship with these buyers. So what is the buyer doing with the property and why is that important to you? It's important because the number one way I'll get to the paperwork, I'll get to the protecting yourself, but the number one way a seller can protect themselves in a creative finance transaction is making sure that your buyer is making money. If your buyer is breaking even every single month on the cash flow, let's say they take over your payments and the payment they take over is less than the money they're bringing in, that's a good thing. They have a spread, they can pay their payroll, they can pay their people, there's a financial benefit for them to be there, right? But what if your payment is higher than what they can rent it for in the market? That's a problem. You do not want to be selling your property to a per person that's gonna rent the property if that's the case. I would make sure that I ask my buyer, what are you doing? Are you doing a midterm rental? Are you doing a short-term rental, right? Midterm rentals like insurance companies will rent these properties when a family has a flood or something happens to their property. They will rent out an investor's property, fully furnished. You, they, you can find these properties on like furnishedfinder.com and all sorts of places. Short-term rentals, what? Airbnb and VRBO. Then you've got sober living or assisted living is another one. Assisted living, regular rental, right? That's about 85% of my portfolio is just regular rental. Then you've got stuff like pad split, which is co-sharing or co-living. Co you probably didn't even probably didn't even know there's all these strategies. There's about I'd say there's about 40 plus strategies on what you can do with the property once you own it as the investor. 40 plus. So I as the seller, I would want to make sure that I know what my buyer is doing with the property so that I know they are making money. Now, of course, I'm an investor. And I'm going to say this to you. And of course, this benefits me to say, hey, make sure, Mr. Seller, Mrs. Seller, that the buyer, me, literally me, can make money. Well, that, yeah, that benefits me, right? But it benefits you too, because this is a long-term relationship. If I'm going to take over your payments on your mortgage, the best way for you to be protected from what happens if and what happens then and what if the da da what if the buyer stops making payments, Pace? Why would, this, why would the buyer stop making payments if you gave them a deal that helps them support their family? It doesn't make any logical sense. So the safest thing you can do as the seller is make sure your buyer has the ability to make money on the property, okay? So knowing who your buyer is is very important. So ask yourself, who's the buyer? What are they doing with it? I wanna make sure they're good. I wanna make sure they're solid. Okay, does the title and closing attorney know what they're doing? Give you a good example. I have a student right here. Her name is Heather Irving. Okay. Today at 930, she says, I'm in the title company trying to close, but they are saying we cannot lien the property for more than what is owed. And I sent her a ni nice one minute voice memo. And then she came back and they said, they're super confused. I had to send her another voice memo. And I told her, reach out to somebody on my team. My team, this just happened. I just showed you the text message. Title companies and escrow officers do not get paid enough money to go out and research all the strategies that are legal in their state. So you will run into title and closing attorneys. And here's the challenge with this, okay? Remember your real estate agent that I told you is not super educated in creative finance. Your real estate agent, guess what? They get kickbacks from title and escrow officers, 100% of them do, when they tell you, hey, we should use, let's say, Fidelity. I like Fidelity, they're awesome, but there's a lot of title companies. Fidelity's a big national one. I, your real estate agent, we should require the buyer to use Fidelity. Perfect, but we did a creative finance transaction. Does your title company actually close transactions like this? You don't know this as a seller, but we do. Title and escrow companies are as common as Starbucks. No exaggeration, there's that many title and escrow companies. So when I'm going around the state and I'm driving around, that title company might be really good working with real estate agents. That title company is investor friendly as we call them. And 
you've got to ask yourself as the seller, does my real estate agent actually know a title company that knows how to do these transactions? Why would I go to a dentist when my foot hurts? Does that make sense? They're both doctors, but why would I go to the dentist when my foot hurts? Real estate agents will just say, Fidelity, they're a title company. No, they're not. The person inside the title company is called an escrow officer. And guess what? This escrow officer came from a different title company, maybe worked for an investor. Maybe they're brand new. Maybe they were friends at real estate school. This person decided, I'm going to go be an escrow officer. You go be a real estate agent and let's share business with each other. Awesome. They should be doing that. But this person, do they have the experience? Do they know what they're doing? Chances are they don't. And so sadly, you should be asking your buyer in a creative finance transaction what title company they want to use. Because chances are they've used a title company that has done these transactions and knows what they're doing. Why is Heather having a hard time closing this deal? She sent me a message and she says, the real estate agent chose the title company. The title company said, yes, we know how to do these transactions. And now they can't close the deal. The seller's upset, blaming the buyer. It wasn't the buyer's problem. It was the real estate agent and title company's problem. These are things your real estate agent will not tell you. Okay. So next one is, does my real estate agent know what they're doing? I know I've been beating up on real estate agents, but I kind of have to because this is something that is not common knowledge. Let's be very clear. Your agent, how long did they go to school? The average real estate agent goes to school for two to three weeks. How do they go get business? They market on social media. They go and do open houses. They network and they do all these things. They spend all their time getting new business. Cool. So if they're spending all their time getting new business, guess what they're not spending their time doing? Getting educated in all, in all the strategies of creative finance. The only way your real estate agent will ever actually understand creative finance is if they interface and do a creative finance deal. So I would ask the, the agent, hey, have you done creative finance deals? Have you been involved in these things? Because if you haven't, I probably should not be taking your advice. And guess what? Chances are their broker also has no experience in creative finance either. You've got to go to people and you've got to work with people to understand creative finance. Now, if the agent doesn't understand creative finance, I hope that they just admit to you, hey, this is my first foray. I, 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 let's go learn this together. A lot of agents end up joining my community just to learn how to do this properly, okay? So ask your agent to be honest with you. And if they say, yeah, I've done these a lot. This is great. Let's do this deal. When was the last one you closed? Now, creative finance, in my opinion, not, my, not even my opinion, is way easier than traditional finance because there's way less people involved. It will be easier on your agent, but there's new terms, new paperwork, new everything that they don't know. Okay, next question. How am I protected as the seller? The number one way you're gonna be protected as the seller is you're gonna be protected by making sure your buyer is getting a deal. I know it sounds like propaganda and maybe it kind of is, to be honest. I obviously wanna get a good deal, right? But we are doing deals with each other. You, as my seller, are going to have a long-term relationship with me and I'll give you a good example. I've got Mario, one of my sellers. Let's just pull it up. Check this out, look at this. I got the payment today, okay, thank you. Then the month before, look, they forgot to pay the monthly mortgage for the blah, 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 Rosewood Apartments at San Angelo. Please remind them today. Who's them? Who's he talking about? This is why having a relationship and making sure your buyer is getting a good deal is important is because my sellers and I become friends. We hang out. Mario not only sold me 43 units on seller finance, by the way, zero down, 4% interest for 50 years. That was the terms that Mario gave me. Why? Because I gave him the number he wanted. Again, saved him the taxes, made his life easy, all of those things. Why did my team fail to make payments? This kind of stuff happens. I'm, I'm being transparent. How did my team stop making payments on his property? We were two days late. It's because we got a new bank and we were in the process of porting everything over. So it's important to have these conversations. My team had emailed him a week before. He just did not see the email. It went to his junk box. We ended up getting on a phone call and figuring that out. So 
Mario knows I got a good deal. He's not worried about getting uh, me getting a, a good deal and making money anymore. He, he says, Pace got a good deal. Check. Now, number two, make sure that the paperwork is done properly. How is the paperwork done properly? Well, there is a community called Top Tier TC. What does that stand for? It means Top Tier Transaction Coordination, actually head up by my head of operations, Molly, and she teaches transaction coordinators to do the paperwork properly to protect the seller and the buyer. So paperwork is very important. Number two, or I'm sorry, number three, you wanna make sure that title and escrow do exactly what you wrote out in the paperwork. Because you will sign twice. You will sign when you do the agreement with the buyer. That's the agreement paperwork or the purchase contract, okay? You'll sign once here, and then you'll have to sign a second time at the title company or maybe with a notary. Make sure that your transaction coordinator or your real estate agent, hopefully your real estate agent just hires or brings in a top tier TC, they verify the final closing documents before the paperwork is closed. Now, inside the paperwork, let's talk about this. You're the seller. You then give the buyer the ability to make payments to you on a monthly basis, right? Whether it's seller finance or subject to. Here's the next question. What happens if this buyer dies? What happens if they stop making payments? What happens, what happens, what happens? What if, what if, what if? Well, we wanna make sure that in the paperwork and the title and escrow, I want you to make sure, we don't need to get into the technical things of this, but you, the seller, should be able to take this property back because your, your paperwork allows you to do so, okay? So I'll keep it very simple. Paperwork, title and escrow, make sure that they are hiring the right people to do the paperwork properly. The seller is protected by giving them a good deal. Paperwork, title and escrow, and inside the paperwork and title and escrow, it gives you the ability to get the property back if that person dies and stops making payments. Now, if I die, am I gonna stop making payments? No, my company owns the properties and my company has hundreds of employees. So the payments will continue to come in. Now, here's the next question you've gotta ask. How? How does the money actually get paid to my bank? So here's how it works. You sell the property to a buyer. Buyer now owns it. The buyer puts in a tenant. The tenant pays the buyer. The buyer puts money in their bank account. Now that buyer, whoever that is, me or somebody else, they have a servicing company. I use a company called Weststar a lot or Evergreen Note Servicing or um, Toro or Fay Servicing. There's a lot of companies that do this. But let me show you, if I just go into, and I type in Weststar, look at this. Weststar will send you a report every month on every property that I'm making. It says, moving forward pays McAleer, okay? McAleer is one of my sellers. Here's the escrow number. Here's the date, 11-1-2023, right? Here's the payment. Here's where it went. All of those types of things. That's done through a servicing company. So I don't pay the seller directly. What ends up happening is the servicing company pulls the money out of my bank account. They pull it out, suck it out of my bank account, and then the servicing company pays the seller, the HOA, the bank. If there's a, a loan on there, it pays whatever needs to get paid. And then it's, Weststar will then send a report to me on the payment and send a report to the seller and everybody else. That's how the payments get made in a sub two or seller finance transaction. I don't actually make seller finance payments directly to the seller. I always hire a servicing company because I love the reporting. It costs like 17 bucks a month per property. It is completely worth it for us to just hire a servicing company to offload the bookkeeping and offload that stuff to make sure the seller is good and everybody's happy. Do I actually need to log into your bank account? No. Do I prefer to have access to, to the bank account where the bank payment gets made? Of course I do. But do I absolutely need it? No, I don't. Next couple of questions should wrap up the video and hopefully this has been helpful. So if you're a seller, please make a comment down below and just say thank you. 
ask us more questions. I'd love to help you guys out. Let's talk about terms because this is kind of the last part of the video. What are terms? When your buyer saying, will you sell to me on terms or sell to me on creative finance? They probably shouldn't be asking those questions because that's a little bit too technical. Most sellers don't know what that means. What they should be saying is, will you let me make payments to you? Will you let, will you become my bank, right? And what they're basically saying with terms is number one, what is our purchase price? Number two, what is my down payment? Now, I get a lot of zero down deals. Zero down is very common for me because I help educate my seller that any down payment they receive, they're gonna pay their capital gains tax on. So the less down payment they receive, the less taxes they end up paying. The only reason a seller really wants a down payment is to make sure that if something goes bad, they have at least some cash to solve the problem, et cetera. But when you have a bona fide legitimate buyer, you typically don't need a down payment. Now, of course, this is also me trying to tell you, the seller, that, hey, please don't make me put a down payment because I gave you a high purchase price, right? I obviously don't want to put a down payment if I, if, I, if I don't have to. My typical down payment is usually between 5 and 10% of the purchase price, okay? So let's say the purchase price on the house is $200,000. I typically am putting 10 to 20K down to the seller. So the seller receives that, that's their security, they feel good about it, all of that. Down payment, cool, that's our, sec our second part of terms. Third part of terms is interest rate. If there's an existing loan in place and we're buying it subject to, well, there's no need to negotiate this, right? Because the interest rate's already the interest rate. So nothing to negotiate. However, if the house is paid off free and clear, then you've got to negotiate what the interest rate is. Now, what I use a lot of times, I use a, bank, a company called bankrate.com and bankrate allows us to go over to bankrate and use one of their calculators to say, well, if I sell to my buyer at 200 grand and I make them put 10 to 20% or 10 to $20,000 down at this interest rate, what will their payment be? It will tell you what their payment will be. You don't have to figure out some fancy spreadsheet, just go to bankrate. Okay, mortgage calculator, very simple. If the payment is higher than what they could rent it for, then you're not giving your buyer a good deal, right? And remember, the best way to, to protect yourself as a seller is to give your buyer a good deal. Number four is length of time. If it's a sub two transaction or a subject two transaction where I'm just taking over payments, usually that's like 30 years. And a lot of sellers will ask the question of, well, what about my credit? Well, what about your credit? You're, you're getting payments made every month on a mortgage. How does that not improve your credit long-term? Keeping the mortgage in your name does nothing but benefit you. And I'll get to debt to income ratio in just a second, we'll wrap up the video. So length of time on a sub two deal, if you just got the loan, well then the sub two deal is gonna be 30 years. In seller finance, what most buyers are shooting for is they're shooting for at least 10 years before they have to refinance, pay you off or sell the property and get your chunk of money. Okay, I won't typically do something less than 10 years. So again, terms means purchase price. That's typically where the seller wins. On top of that, their tax savings and other things. So the seller is winning here, right? That's their big thing. They're getting the purchase price. Typically retail value, saving money on commissions, saving money on taxes, tons of benefit here. And then the buyer, I know it seems like they're winning on more things, but they're not. The seller gets the higher purchase price, they're making more money, and then the buyer has to basically take years to go get their return. So down payment, interest, and length of time, and that's what terms are, okay? Now, final thing I'll touch base on is, well, Pace, if you have my loan, and in, in the loan stays in my name, which is what happens in subject two, how do I go get another loan? Well, this is called DTI, right? Debt to income ratio. So what we'll do is I'll give you guys access to a video down below. It'll be a video with one of my loan officers talking about how we remove the need for this worry. Okay, we've had about 400 sellers. They were in the process of buying a new house while they were selling their house to a subject too. I've never had a problem showing their new bank that the old bank payment was no longer their responsibility and that we were the ones making the payment. There's a process that you go through, there's paperwork that you go through, but a good buyer, somebody who's learned from me will know how to do that. So I know this has been a long video, probably 40 minutes, maybe even longer, but I wanted to make sure you had this video. I hope it helped you. Whatever questions you have, please leave them down below. We'll do maybe a whole series on how 
to educate a seller on selling a property subject to or seller finance. Even jump into other strategies and share this with other people. A couple of things. If you are wanting to join our community, we'll put a link down below. If you want to learn how to be a transaction coordinator to do these transactions, we'll put a link down below. Please take the time. Tell us what you thought about this video, how it's going to help you. And if you're an investor, feel free to share this with your sellers. I hope this helps you with your sellers and understanding what they should be asking you. And be a good buyer. Be somebody who honors your word, do all the right things. And we'll see you guys in the next video.